What do you think led to such a big change at a school like Harvard, as well as other elite colleges to not have so many professors like that anymore who are, um, whether it's more conservative or just interested in maybe um, a different view of truth, things like that. Um, those professors are so rare now. It, I, it, well, it's, uh, it, it's an easy and a, and a difficult question to answer at the same time, I think. Um, the people who influenced me were not all conservatives. Um, Judith Schlar was a great professor of political philosophy uh, who was definitely on the liberal side. Michael Walzer, who's still alive, still going, um, was there also. And Sam Huntington, who, was, who became more conservative in his own life and career as, uh, as things went on, but he was, he was not known as a conservative back then. Uh, and so, uh, the trends have changed, I would say somewhat from political theory to, um, more postmodern themes, uh, which first affected, uh, comparative literature and philosophy and eventually the whole university. And, uh, among the, the directions that postmodernism took was woke, uh, you know, wokeness, uh, which is the latest version of, of, uh, of that. And none of those movements, uh, of those postmodern movements has been friendly to the serious study of history or great political or other great texts. Um, they have been, uh, they've been parasitic on those traditions. And um, I'm afraid that that is what that is, that has impacted the universities of the country um, enormously and badly. Right. And can you tell us a little bit about why postmodernism has has taken over in this way? And why is it so harmful if students only learn from that perspective? Well, postmodernism is, uh, um, you know, it has, in, in some sense, deep philosophical roots in the thought of uh, Nietzsche and uh, Heidegger and other uh, really great thinkers at the end of the 19th century and in the, in the early 20th century. But it is a it, it is a frivolous and unserious movement. I think it's it's not worthy really of the of the great sources uh, of its uh, of its insights uh, and it's frivolous because it can be used so um, unseriously um, you can if you're a postmodernist you really don't believe in reason you don't believe in the capacity of reason to come to uh, to discover truths or to apprehend truths that are out there uh, that is that are not shaped by human will or human uh, culture or human ideology and and as such it it uh, it becomes a kind of power game it reduces um, serious philosophy theology um, all serious intellectual enterprises in a way to a kind of uh, uh, power hungry game playing um, in which what matters is really not the truth but uh, power and uh, truth is a means to power, and thus it is not truth uh, anymore. Um, and that, that, I think, is uh, what has engendered so much cynicism uh, and, uh, and hopelessness and lack of <clears throat> what would have been called idealism in undergraduates today and in faculty members today. I mean, if you're, if you're on a college these days, um, you find out that, uh, you know, there, there's not a lot of courage to be observed uh, uh, in anyone, uh, least of all in the administration or the faculty. But even among uh, students, it's in very uh, short supply. Uh, and that's because they're all very sensitive to their reputations. Uh, and this is where sort of postmodernism and social media meet. I think in um, in the current intellectual landscape, um, nobody wants to have a virtual mob uh, arrive outside their the virtual mailbox, you know, and pelt them with virtual stones uh, for the rest of their lives about something 
um, they said uh, on a college campus when they were 18 or 19 years old. And so there's a certain kind of um, cowardice, a certain kind of con- uh, of um, cowardly, uh, in a way, cowardly concern for your reputation um, that acknowledges, you know, that the uh, truth is just what most people say or assert, uh, and that you don't want to be on the wrong end of such uh, assertions. Uh, and that, and that um, is why, you know, where you once had demonstrations on political campuses that were, I mean, going back to the, to the you know, to the 60s, um, demonstrations that were political and idealistic and moral and, you know, the civil rights movement and things like that. Uh, you have very few of those anymore. Um, the, the typical demonstrations you have are much more denunciations of a speaker uh, for uh, heterodox uh, viewpoints, uh, denunciation of uh, people who, with whom you disagree um, because they must be wrong if they don't agree with you. Uh, that kind of thing, very disappointing uh, and very exhausting in a way. Um, and that's sort of the, and very unidealistic. And that's, that's sort of the modern campus life, I'm afraid. Right. And they often say, you know, truth to power and things like that. And they do often do a lot of their demonstrations as being negative, really trying to prevent people from speaking, kick speakers off of a campus, prevent anyone from having an opposing viewpoint from being a professor or another student. Um, And I think like you were saying, if you were more idealistic, you might hope that there would be more debate or you would hope that there would be more discussion between these different viewpoints.